Now, I figured that we all have very, very many questions to ask um, that are relevant to um, any interaction between the responders and the research community. So I figured best to get everyone into one place and go. So, far away, who's first? No one. Okay. Yeah, no, but I have one. <laughs> I need to find my head. We have a number of questions, so maybe I'll start with the first one. It came up when I just uh, looked at your presentations. You were talking about uh, reducing the size of robots, making them back back even or stuff like that. On the other hand, I just looked at the picture from the green and the lot of one <coughs> big times, big one. How do you think a uh, robot could uh, navigate there? Maybe overcome a stone that is twice as high as the robot? Maybe a problem there. Well, I think with Katrina, because of the wood debris, it's such as something that, that a rescuer is going to be able to traverse. I mean, it, it's just showing you different types of, of debris fields that are out there. The one that showed the house with the door with the, the different layers that you can actually come in and maybe there be void spaces that were there, that's more applicable where you can't get a rescuer in. But for somebody traversing over the top of the piles, I just don't see a robot doing it. We've got canines that are going to do that. We have rescuers that do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll carry them into that point and then we'll deploy them when we find openings that we that we can't get into. So they won't, it won't be going over all that stuff to get to where it needs to go. We'll bring them there, and then once we get there, um, if I can't climb in the hole, uh, I, I need to send a robot in there. So you think inside of the house there is uh, not much wrong? Oh, they're probably, yeah, yeah that's why we're, we're, we're setting up the, the test standards to hopefully address that. I mean, not every robot's gonna get over everything we needed to get over, unfortunately. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it is, but if we can have them overcome most of it, um, it's a lot better than we have now. I think that's also the importance of having small enough to backpack in, is that if you are traversing across the <laughs> fields like that, you can carry it. And like I said, it gets to the point where he can't go in, you can deploy it at that time. This is also regarding a, 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 a similar scenario which you can ask, which was uh, when you throw, you said you want to throw a robot inside and you see these, uh, these holes, right? And you know, you're told by uh, by structural engineers that you can't go inside it. So uh, my question is basically, should um, <coughs> should the cost of the simplicity of the robot they, uh, come into play when you're designing, designing this robot, when you're discussing it? Simply because if you throw inside one out of one of six robots that you guys are carrying that, that are heavy and uh, expensive, and you can't recover them back, uh, then perhaps the next few houses that you visit you don't have your robots with you. So would it, would it, it, from that standpoint, would it make more sense to have a, like a 120, 150 really cheap, small robots that can, uh, they just go maybe, and you can, you can order them whenever you want, they easily be able to. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's where we're trying to go is, is right developing it to where you get to the point where they become disposable, you know? Right. Until we get to that point, we have to look at some other mechanism to recover them, yeah. and now we're looking at the tether, you know, and right. because it's the only way you get it back out. Yeah. Yeah. My question is the obvious question. Uh, on my side. Can okay, you speak up, please? <laughs> oh. so my question was, uh, for you, what would be your ideal interface with the robot? Would you like to speak to it? Would you like to be able to touch it and interact with it like that? Would you want to have something in your hand? I think for, from my standpoint, I think your track is very good. As in, if we have all of smartphones or some sort, so we can just do it through there, then that's a very good place to go. So we can with, with, with light conditions like they are at times, you know, using some, something with a screen. I've used virtual goggles before, you know, with, with a controller, and it does make it kind of nice to where you don't have to battle with the ambient, you know, sun, light, so I think that's a possibility too, is maybe that type of capability where you could either use a screen, a handheld device, or maybe a goggle that would, you know, you could use in literally all light conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I asked a similar question to Japanese respondents. And the answer is <coughs> simplicity is best, and they want to keep one hand free. One hand operation, if they have a free hand, if something falls down, or uh, umbrella grip, well, so they are simple one hand operation. 
is the data and also the voice for something very simple way or intuitive way the uh, Japanese responder for such interface. Well, the goggles can be some sort of an option because you know, like the uh, like the, cam, the whole search cam that we showed uh, <coughs> that has a system that's box where you can actually look through the screen the and the shroud. Yeah, yeah, the shroud where you can actually make it dark. So, but a handheld device that's widely acceptable, then nobody else is going to buy additionally. You could, like a phone, would be, uh, would be very good. I can tell you what we don't want is what, like on the <coughs> remote tech robots, they have this board and it's got, must have 20 different levers and toggles and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of times you have to hold up this lever and go like this to be able to, you know, to lift your arm and do something at the same time. Actually, I had a video that I didn't show where the news media was there overlooking the shoulder of one of the bomb techs on a call, and it was kind of comical. He was trying to show me, he says, well, you have to, you push this lever up with this finger and push this lever back with this thumb, and you move this lever here with this hand, and this makes it go this and that, and it, it, so it takes a long time to really get proficient at that system. Versus, you know, one that, that, like you were talking about, that maybe you just had a lever, one lever could go back and forth, side to side, and push button, and you know, click maybe a finger here, push with the thumb there, all in one hand. The rescuers have actually talked about this at Disaster City with the NIST uh, exercises, <coughs> about trying to standardize to a one remote controller that literally would work with all the applications, because every robot has a different controller. So if you're going to try and simplify it and make them, you know, somewhat standardized, it'd be nice to literally have a template that they'd all work off. that would be very similar so you don't have to relearn different consoles when you deploy different platforms. Well, uh, so I was going to ask for the, the robots that you evaluate, have you tried uh, with any uh, snake robots? Have you seen anyone that actually work? Did we use a snake at uh, Disaster City? Mm -hmm. Haven't done it through debris, but we've actually penetrated through a wall and the uh, one go and collapsed. Yeah. They're real good for all these different applications. They go up, up pipes, like drain pipes are going, you know, that type of deal. Yeah, they work very well. Um, they're, they're long, they're narrow, uh, they can get places where others can not so. so. So what's the sensors of those carrying the, is it just the camera or is it carrying the Just to be clear, are you talking about Satoshi's thing? No, that's no, that's something more just talking about. Oh, oh okay. Oh, good. Oh, they're talking about Satoshi's. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. However, Anything that goes through any sort of borehole that they can put into the side of the building, that's not unreasonable. That might not be unreasonable. We could call a snake, maybe it's a segmented snake, maybe it's something else, long, thin robot. Uh, in our last exercise, we remotely deployed one of those snakes from a canine. Uh, Send a canine in with a pouch that was remote release and deployed a snake. Yeah. Yeah. So, what we should really talk about is what is the suite of sensors that they want.
inside of that void, you have no idea what it is. And so they know they're up. They know I want to drill over there. The question is, how far over there am I supposed to drill? If I don't come down on the victim, but I come down here. So uh, are you also interested in a uh, uh, sense of touch? Uh, we want to be able to touch something like the system would be enforced with that. Is that interesting? Is that typically used in such I, I think if you got to the point where you're looking at maybe victim retrieval, you know what I mean, with, with that type of attach where you'll crouch, I, I think that's the point, but I think that's a little bit farther down the road probably than where we're probably at right now. I think right now we're looking at search and attack, you know, essentially with these things to be able to be a mechanism for a team to deploy, to be able to avoid space if you look size, to get in there, to search, identify a victim, maybe make contact if it's got a tether, you know, we've got unlimited power, we've got communications, we may have life, we may have a lot of other things to where you can establish, you know, that link. Verbal Absolutely, yeah. And then and then we start looking at deploying rescue teams and what we're going to... But even during the detection phase, do you, you, as search and rescue people, do you actually use your hands to feel things? Is that something you do or not? You just want to use the Oh, as in your searching? Yeah, as a search, yeah. you when we're do, When we're diving, we would... Obviously, you're using your hands because you can't see. Usually, zero visibility. Pretty much with the robotics that we've seen, I really had to come into an environment where it's been really zero visibility because we have some way of illumination or IR, or, or there's some way we're seeing, visualizing. Yeah, when you're talking touch, <laughs> there's no chance you have to do it. Maybe I'm going to write right Adam and tell you honestly. I have a lot of questions related to uh, operator control units as well. So, um, I think there is this gap that you want more and more features, but also standardized um, control units. So this may be a gap that Um, I know that Kinetic came up with one controller now, technical robot controller that steers the uh, uh, Bobcat, and some and whatever it is, and we have any experience with that? Small mechanical device. I know, I know what's been... What was on top of the Bobcat, it's actually called PRC. Oh, that, that, uh... Kinetic is what it's called. Oh, oh, Kinetic, oh, I I, I know the, uh, this has been discussed with, they mentioned, with the robot manufacturers for a long time. And from what I've heard and heard them talk about, they adamantly refused to, you know, that, that JAWS, that joint, uh, whatever it is, JAWS, you know, because that was one of the things that JAWS called for. And they ab absolutely refused to go to any type of a standardized uh, controller box because they, they do not, they say, well, ours is proprietary and everybody's afraid to give up their proprietary information to somebody else to come up with the standardized box. And so I don't think that's going to happen. But what I, what I, I think they are probably trying to work towards is a more simplistic box without all the, the, the levers and things like that. So I don't know if that answers what you were. It tells me that the problem is behind the proprietary solution for our company. That's a big issue. Yep. <coughs> There is a robot under development called the Advanced Features, Advanced EOD, the supporting disposal robot system, the Adris. That is based on JAWS 4, which is kind of new and not really fully baked yet. You know, so the government is going to put a lot of money behind a, an interoperable robot, built from scratch to have a mobility module, which has its own architecture in it to be plug and play with a manipulator, with an interface, with a radio comms system. So everything gets a little more expensive. There's controller modules on each of the pieces of components, but they are supposed to be able to be more competitive in terms of opening a market for any other solutions. It's, uh, you know, due in a year or two. So it might be the beginning of the future for that. You know, just make Whether it's going to catch on or not. So the mobility is being done by Macro USA. The manipulator is being done by RE Squared. That's all I know. <coughs> well, okay, so I guess to speak up so that the um, firstly with regard to scanning and stuff, so a few people have mentioned like the connect and like tracking it in a hole and, and getting a map from that. Um, what sort of occlusions do you, do you generally get?
get. So like imagine if you throw a device in and it's got a little scanner on it and sort of it looks around into the room. Unless it has some sort of arm to lift it up or something, it's probably not going to be able to walk. If there's any rocks in the way or something, that's going to be a shadow, and so you're not going to see around that. It, is that um, a realistic problem? Would you then need something even on a small throwable robot to like lift the sensor up and do a bit of pan around? Or would it be enough to have it at ground level, just sort of looking around, talking back and forth? I think the option is nice because you know you can throw it in there and you just end up behind the wall, <coughs> and then it's useless. Well, I mean, ideally it would be able to, it not be able to move, um, so it would be wheeled or tracked or something, so it could move around. But it would be a lot simpler to create a robot that doesn't need to look something up. Yeah, if there is like a retractable antenna. Well, and I think what we've seen at Disaster City is we've seen some very high-tech scanning capabilities on very unruggedized platforms. I think Doug and I have talked a lot about this, about taking high-tech made from Japan and integrating it into another platform that's hard, you know what I mean, to, to get the best of both worlds. And it need, it, we need to see that kind of interoperability within the community where if you have something that, that works really well and if you can get that attached to a platform that would allow you to move it to where you want to go, so human size void, maybe you can bring in some kind of a scanning capability, some kind of a cube or something that they could deploy out. I mean, to me, you can be, get the best of both worlds. And then these sort of sensors that use um, infrared ones, <coughs> Any, if you try to use them outside in bright sunlight, they're just dark <coughs> because they get saturated. How much of your work is actually done in, do you ever need to scan a, an outdoor area or is it always generally deep down inside a hole where it's dark? Yeah, yeah normally it's going to be, 99 yeah, yeah, the time. Time. most of the time it's going to be dark. Um, outside scanning we can do with air bots, uh, we can do with ourselves visually. Um, or get on a higher platform and then do it ourselves. But you know, it's, we need it basically in dark, pretty much low light or dark environments. Because to understand how our system works, we have canines with the point, right, on the pile. Yeah. We have cracks, we have sunlight, we have human scent coming out. So most of the time that canine's gonna hit on that spot, it'll be confirmed. If there's a crack we can stick an object like a snake into, you know, we're gonna stick that, we won't necessarily have to be scanning that way, so. Okay, and then just two other questions. Um, you, you mentioned, well, obviously depth perception is a problem when you're remotely operating a vehicle. Has anyone tried to do stereo cameras, like not in the sense of computer-based stuff, literally just two cameras on the device with two um, separate feeds and bubbles so that you can... Look to the left, look to the right? Uh, that, or not even, just to get depth perception from For looking through yeah. two different video feeds. No, it's actually to get depth. At our base, yeah. Literally, just putting the way your eyes are on the device. I haven't seen it. You know what I mean? That's one of the um, <coughs> tool manipulator shoelace tying fields. I uh, have been using that. You know what they're saying? Is that's conventional, relatively speaking, conventional technologies that go into a human process where there's a lot of trying to stereotype and navigate and stuff like that, but it's just to feed the operator a little bit more depth perception. I guess the question is, are those things, why aren't those things catching up? Is it because you can't wear them for more than 20 minutes, which is what it takes you to drive down range efficiently, or to do whatever job you can, you know, which requires my clarity and focus? But it is a possible field for research. Yeah, no, it should be absolutely, we as RoboCup should have a test method that rewards that just so that we can exercise that technical lane and give these guys classes and let them decide if it's working for them. If they only use it for 20 minutes, but that's all they needed, the 20 minutes were fine. It would have a very low tech solution to a big problem. Generally, yeah, with the cameras that are on there now, it is difficult though. I mean, if, if you go up there, and, it's, and another thing that's very difficult is using cameras if you have your claw out here in front, you know, you're, and then you have a disruptor back here, you, you have to really put some sort of a, you know, a little 
laser on there and mount it on the disruptor so that then you can put it down and shoot it, you know, and then put it on the mark because that's the, the disruptor is generally way back here. That's really difficult to get a, a bead on it, like if you're going to shoot a pipe on or something like that right there. So that's the application that requires the absolute most precision. Yeah. Or get her and, and the last question for, for more the search and rescue. Um, with, with regards to the sonar, um, or, or rather the, the track personal location with sound, is that just a random sort of placement of the six senses and then listening to each one individually and seeing which one is picking up the strongest mm -hmm. signal? Or have you tried um, things like um, Communicating between the sensors, and each of them knows what they're listening to, and then you could use sort of sound location techniques with multiple microphones to to detect. Well, this one's hearing this sound. This one heard it so many milliseconds later, and you can do directionality and stuff based on that. Is no, but, but it does have filters that you can use, and it, it, you do the foil, you have digital, and you can see it on the readouts for sound. And if you're looking for the sensor that's picking up the greatest amount of the sound you're looking for, you know, using your filter. So once you've identified that, you triangulate it a little bit, and you start to, to continue to, to do your grid, make that grid smaller, 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 until you essentially have your point where the sound's coming from. That's kind of a starting point then. There's a lot of human judgment in there. Oh, there is, too. Because it's a highly non-homogeneous environment. Total judgment calls to you tried to put it on slab of concrete, yeah. but you had no idea what was going on six inches later. Well, well yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was thinking because you could, I mean, put a higher resolution grid of sensors and do cross correlation and stuff mm -hmm. to figure out exactly where sound is coming from, but then again, it could have been reflected or something else. So, the actual question I was going to ask is is there any point in looking into that further, or does sound generally tend to come through any opening and it could have actually originated somewhere completely different? Um, but we're looking more for sound that's coming up through solid objects. You know, I mean, somebody that's able to get down and get a piece of pipe or you know something that's, that's allowing sound to travel. You were picking up that side. So it's going to be transmitted over a large yeah. area anyway. So there's no so point you, trying to narrow. They can narrow the grid down. Yep. No, no, they're not saying it's no, no we can narrow it down. What? Well, yes, but points. okay. But yeah. like through a large piece of concrete, you're going to hear it pretty much anywhere on that concrete. So you won't be able to get an exact yeah, the sensors are very sensitive, so I mean, even, even, if it's, even if it's very similar to the human ear, once those sensors are sensitive enough to um, kind of different, if you see on your screen which one, you know, yes. you know, there are notches on it, so you can uh, you can easily say, okay, maybe you know, this one has only just a small nudge or noise, but it's higher, so you shift according to there. And you can also plug in all of the search engine is very primitive compared to all these things we're thinking about here. Uh, you can plug in a second uh, headset onto the machine, onto the sensors, and then so people can listen just so just to kind of reduce the risk of one person's human error. That's the judgment part. Yep, that's the judgment no, part. So now you think you heard something. How do you tell the people on the pile who have picked a spread based on where they can get to to put their listening devices down? How do you tell them to move? Where, where do you tell them? So the sensors are identified one to six. So it says right on the sensor. So once you've identified which sensor is picking up, picking up the greatest amount of sound, you then reconfigure the sensors around, building away from that point to see if, if you're narrowing that scope or by putting one to the other sides up or that. Uh, so you that keep one. triangulating around until you get to where you're on top of the sound. But so there's no localization in that. There's no incremental motions in that. Maybe it's not incremental because they can't actually. There's something between the two spots. That so it's partly I mean, the, mm -hmm. this is the, way, the way you switch the sensors is actually very analog, so to speak. If you have a one that picks up the noise most of the sensor, <coughs> and then number six is the furthest point away from the sound, then you would take that and use the sensor one as the center point, and then put the exact opposite side of sensor one, and then shift the other ones. Unless you're playing the sound. Yep. So it's not like that. I'm uh, closer and closer to being a box smaller, but if you had localization involved, you can make more incremental steps. You might be able to learn from the last signal about the environment that that listening device is looking through, different than this one, and close in much quicker. Apply the focus more intelligently. 
uh, one, one comment for the uh, sound search uh, in Japan, uh, especially in the Kobe earthquake, many buildings collapsed, and the sound or the voice is only the uh, information to identify the victim location. But to hear the victim voice, everything should be silent. Construction, digging, everything around the radius 50 meters or so. So that's the silent time degrade the searching performance to other areas. So we have a nice technology to background noise cancellation. It's a very, very nice. That's very true because even when you're on top of the rubble, if you have a person moving, a person on your heat sensor, and you know, they have, we tell them to uh, kneel because you know, they should be with shifting their feet. And everybody else, all the public who are watching us work, you know, we, of course, in Turkey, because the public is a bit of a control, uh, you will will tell them to sit down. <coughs> yeah, it has to be absolute silence. So while we're talking about sound, the noise of your robot affects your ability to listen while you're driving anyway, so you might need to stop, both your listening on occasion, and you might not be listening for voices, you might be listening for someone banging on pipes in some sort of pattern that would be <coughs> something like through me. Bumper, but you know what's safe or not. 
and talk to one another. Give them choices. Spirit planning behavior. A, B, or C. They'll pick B when they see something that looks B to them. They'll cycle through them all sequentially. They might have a good starting point. But so just so I understand that when the robot was sent into the nuclear reactor, it was capable of autonomous control of the flipper. But the operators didn't want it to happen because they wanted the complete ability. Yeah, trust me. Even, even though it probably would have made them more efficient. Okay. Uh, as you said, uh, nuclear reactor twins have some autonomous capability, but technical operator refuse. No, tele, no autonomous, only teleoperation. Was it the flipper behavior that we were talking about? Everything should be teleoperation anymore. No mm -hmm. autonomous. Right. But that's, that's a training issue. That's a side by side. If they knew what that robot looks like when it does automatic spare climbing, it is idiot proof. But we just need to prove itself statistically so that they trust it. The force field thing we've seen implemented in the game, Robocop, it worked beautifully. Stay off the wall, sent between objects, and it came up to some glass and it stopped. And the responder who had to be behind it said, well, I don't know why it stopped. It looks clear to me. Override, boom, right through it. Just plexiglass, glass, it did not go. But it was a trust issue that stopped it from being implemented well in front of it. Okay, another issue when it comes to UAVs research on smart coordination for reconnaissance of key areas. The question is, do you have some files or historical data on weather conditions showing the work? Uh, so just sitting in the every tower and then expect that weather is fine, no wind, and the drones can fly how they want. If you tell me weather is most time bad, we can just abandon all this research. Do you have some data on that? Well, I mean, statistically, if you look at hurricane, the hurricane's going to come through. You're going to, it's going to bring some other weather with it, right? It's passing through and down. It goes from a hurricane to a tropical storm with a depression. So you may have some residual effects with some weather, with some, some rain. You know, if it's a hurricane event, an earthquake may be different. You know, it may be an earthquake during a time when there's rain, and it may not be. I mean, that's the variable <coughs> there. Yes, in Japan, uh, we are now a combined disaster typhoon and uh, big earthquake. We are, uh, it's a kind of scenario. So. Many, any kind of a weather condition we expect. So do you have statistical evidence of the history or is it just a relation that I have? Are you talking about water resistance or for the elements? Well, the, the main issue for, for swarm coordination is uh, for UAVs. So if there's a wind and how strong it might be. Like the temperature of the weather. And, and some of the things, one of the ones I didn't get to present was one of the UA, UAVs that was the, the Electron the Avenger. It's rated up to 65 miles an hour, uh, geostationary with satellite. So it's it's a bigger one though. Yeah. The smaller ones like Air Robot or Air Robot, they have a much much harder time with the wind. I think anytime you're looking at a hurricane event though, you can expect you're going to see some wind until it is pushed all the way through. So if it's being deployed by an IST team that's coming in right either before the event, the event's going to happen. They're going to hunker down, and as the event passes, you're going to have residual effects. They're going to go out in the field. So I think there's always a potential, especially for hurricane. You know, for weather, both wind and, and rain. Uh, bomb tech. What about normally? I, I just want to check with the information that I have. What is what is the link for the safety zone, like uh, the distance that the station and the robot, and normally how long time that yeah you have to use the robot for one mission, that kind of thing. How long do we usually use it? Yes. If it's for a SWAT operation, it could be a long time. Because, you know, during the time they're negotiating and talking to somebody, we may, but, but usually, uh, okay, so uh, if, if we're assessing SWAT, usually what we would do is get the robot out, make sure it's charged up and ready to go, turn it off and let it just sit there. And then if they eventually say, okay, we want you to go in, then you're ready to go. And that could take, geez, I don't know, an hour, maybe, you know, by the time you get up there, especially if the front door's shut and locked, you'd have to get up there and shoot it and knock it open, then go in there and then start, you know, taking your time, looking behind, you know, chairs and sofas and, and checking each room as you go through. So that could, that could take, what, an hour, an hour and a half? Okay. What about bomb take, like bomb spot? 
for just a regular bomb call, I would say it's a lot faster because you usually, you have something there. And so you go right up there to it. Uh, if you have a disruptor, it's already loaded up, you've already got a plan what you're going to do. You go up there, right up there to it, put the disruptor and shoot it and break it open or break it apart. So, you know, the, uh, that, that would be a lot faster because with the, with the SWAT part, you don't really have a plan until you get in there and see what you have. With uh, uh, an IED or a suspicious package, you know what you're going to do. <coughs> Generally, you know what, uh, <coughs> what it looks like, so you, you, you already have a plan formulated. Okay, and what about the radio control for the robots? Because uh, like the RF, IED, so there are various type of the radio frequency that the terrorists use right now. They use RF, they use mobile phone, they use many things. So what I heard uh, back in my country, what they are trying to do is they do the jamming first. And would that jam our own robot? Uh, do, you, do you know about this? Well, or have experience? As far as jamming, there are probably 15 bomb squads in the United States that have jamming capability. And that was money that was money that was given to them and to purchase this through the federal government. So as of now, that's, that's yeah, maybe 15 or 20. You cannot use any type of jamming device in the United States without getting, for, and we actually have a protocol now. So you would have to go to the FBI, and the FBI would have to notify all these other government <coughs> agencies before, and then they would all have to say yes, 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 before you can come back to you and say you can use any type of jamming device. Um, so, so that part is, is kind of cumbersome, but it is workable. You could do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, we haven't had hardly any devices here that were set off by, you know, by RF. So it, it, it's kind of, the capability is there, but it's not really right up front being pushed real hard right now. Does Thailand jam? Yeah, we even shut down the, the mobile phone system for that specific area. So you usually run your robots on a tether? Right now, what we have, we are using like 5 gigahertz, and that so far, uh, I never heard that they have a problem with jamming. But jamming is because it depends on the yeah, terrorists. They start with the radio frequency, later on they use that the pad on the radio frequency to talk to the bomb, mobile phone and stuff. So they do jamming. Yeah, I don't think you could use, use RF capability on the robot and do jamming at the same time because you're going to jam the signal on the robot. You'd have to use the fiber optic line. Uh, you can, but it's much more expensive. And usually, no how, how far that you you think that is a safe, like your station and the bomb? Okay. Stand off. Stand up, like Oh, I think you could go a lot farther with tether. And I mean, if you put a 2,000-foot spool on there, that you, I mean, you could go 2,000 feet and around corners and everything else. Whereas you couldn't generally do that with RF. Okay. I, I like the tethered part myself. I mean, spool I know it's on it's, the robot. Huh? Spool on the robot. What is the from the robot. shot test? This test that you believe that is say like 50 meter or 100 meter? Oh, how far do we generally get back? Well, it depends on how big it is. If it's only something small, then you don't have to get back as far. Maybe just get back uh, from here to the, to the building over there and just get around the corner. You know, so you just work around the corner, just go around the corner, it goes right up to it. If it's something small, if it's something bigger, like a, you know, backpack size, well, you, you probably want to be back a little bit farther and around the corner. And so a lot of it just depends on the location, you know. I mean, if you're working something right here outside the building, if you got down here and got around, you know, behind this wall and behind that wall, and you know, I think you'd be okay. So, so it just depends on the size. And normally, would you like to use the X-ray? machine together to check what's going on inside or I, I talked to Ami they said we just disrupt it shoot it no x-ray <laughs> Air Force said we use x-ray you know what I, I think we, a lot of guys have come to the conclusion you know what they're saying if it looks like a duck it probably is a duck you know uh -huh. uh, a lot of times now most bomb squads that, that I know of you go, you go down there if you got something that laying there and it looks like a pipe bomb 
why go down there and x-ray it? There's no need to. Just go down there and shoot it and break it apart. If you got something that's really suspicious, you know, generally just go down there and shoot it and, and be done with it. And then, and then if it's somebody's briefcase, you go, ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. and but, but the x-ray part, I think x-ray is kind of taking a step back a little bit. I don't think people are doing x-rays mm. near as much as they used to. I, see. I mean, that's my opinion. But why is the question? It's not like they wouldn't like to have an x-ray. It's oh, like yeah. they I mean, could not make it happen remotely using the robot really models that they had. Really, really heavy. It was too cumbersome to even yeah, think about it. Yeah, If you could not hang a little single-sided x-ray that just went up there and should be able to do it, absolutely. Use it every time. Yeah. But as of now, you have to take these contraptions down there. You have to have your film hanging on this yeah. side, your X-ray hanging on this side, and lower them down, and push the button, and hoping it works, and then it doesn't work, and you got to bring it back and try to figure out why it didn't work. And pretty soon, you say, "Screw it! Just go down there and shoot it." You know? It also matters where you are. If it's a military, if it's a border thing versus downtown municipal building. There's probably other overlay of concern. But we can what? talk bluntly about the timing. Go ahead. Uh, just uh, maybe from your experience, may not relate to the robot uh, robotics, but we have one problem that uh, the terrorists they dig up the hole underneath the the pathway. I mean the road, and they put the gas uh, bomb and maybe the gas tank or something underneath it, and then once yeah the soldier or whatever yeah. pass through, so they just detonate it. Any way that we can find that, uh, like clear the road before the times. So I'm sure the. I don't know that because we haven't had that. I'm sure the military though has put up with many of those different types of issues in Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. on varied IEDs. I mean that's maybe they have something, but, but as far as state and local bomb squads, I don't think we even have that as a problem. And there hasn't been a capability that we need. Okay. Kind of along the same line a little bit, I know that Fairfax did a little bit of work with ground penetrating radar, right? With the ability to look through concrete for a victim on either side of a wall. Uh -huh. Probably along the same lines with the military, maybe like dry ADs out in front that are buried. I don't know exactly where that went. I know there was something that kind of slowed that process, whether it was the size or application. They don't or see very far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all better off looking for disturbed earth. And then it moves from disturbed earth to the garbage on the side or something else or into the culverts underneath. Which is why we need a culvert test for to find space. Okay. Sometimes if you want to blow it up or just find it. And what you're talking about is a device that's aimed to kill people. You yeah, know? Just aim for a soldier. Right, right. So but yeah. I mean it's it's but it's intended to kill people. Yeah. Soldiers or whoever. Okay. You know, we're not talking about that now where we have really had to put up with those type of um, <clears throat> you know booby trap devices where they're really trying to kill the bomb tech. Let's see. Question over here. Right, question is a follow-up. And we have seen uh, a few examples where our victims are carrying the robots and going. What would be the ideal time that they're working for the time for the deployed robot over the is that like a new requirement that you have? Like it should work for like two hours, three hours, or? Is it duration? Yeah, duration. On battery? Yeah. And that's one of the tests that Adams are working with at NIST is endurance. Well, endurance and cash packaging. Yeah. So the cash packaging is all about, they have shifts that are 12 hours. They are downrange for 12 hours. You need to walk them downrange with everything they need to be continuously operational for 12 hours. If that means your battery life is 20 minutes, you're sending them down with a backpack full of batteries too. Right. Yep. So it's a trade-off, it's a balance. You know, robot operation time, they might say 20 minutes is acceptable. If I'm just doing a, a hasty search and trying to clear a little void or a room and coming back out, I can put another battery in and go, it's okay. So it's not like, I mean, they have all kinds of different applications. You have to understand that too. So if you had extraordinary dwell time and only 20 minutes of mobility time, they would find use for that. It would be to emplace sensors to check if buildings are shifting over time. Like, is it going to fall down? The structural engineers want to watch the building over the course of the next few days and the next few aftershocks to see if it's getting worse. 
So they want to replace the sensor and pull that sensor off the lab for days. What are the what do you generally encounter now when it comes to long uh, time requirements for a robot? I mean, like eight hours. How do you generally do it now? Like you take a turn, or uh, you actually have like loads of batteries getting recharged all the time? We don't have robots. I mean, that's the problem. We don't have anybody out, any robots out there. No, no, we're search and rescue side. That's why we're here. On, the, yeah. on our side, yeah, they do. But yeah. on, that's why we're here. We're, we need your help, <laughs> um, and we're asking for a lot. We don't have anything right now, land-based. Uh, we have underwater and air-based, but land-based, we don't have anything right now that we're using um, that can meet the requirements that we need. And getting to the level that the bomb squads use robots, if we can use them at the same. Yeah. We're asking for a lot. I mean, we want we love to have a robot who can do both battery power and shore and plug in with the tether, so that, and to extend its life. Um, we're asking for a lot. We'd like to have all the toys that you can develop. Does this mean every robot's going to use all those toys? But there's some, there's times where we might just need light and sound only, but have the capability if we need, if we have the space, you know, to put something else on there, like cameras and a few other things to attach on there to, you know, to make it more usable in certain environments. We don't need all the toys all the time. We're gonna use some of the toys all the time. You know, does that make sense? Because um, so, a payload may be as simplistic as a can yeah. of water, energy bar, a wa yeah. bottle of water, you know, that you're trying to get into somebody. To help, you know, I'm surprised with water. Yeah. That's, I think that's what we're kind of looking with the subhuman size void, is that tether, the recovery tether. Like Doug said, maybe one that can be Detachable, but once again, you kind of remedy the battery part of it. You know, where it can come in and essentially be stationary. You know, inside, if you're establishing a communication like with somebody you found, yeah, like your laptop. I mean, you, you use battery when you don't have a plug-in, but if you have a plug-in, you plug it in. So, but you can use it both ways. That's what we're looking for eventually. Um, First, all right, so urban switch rescue is the hardest part. What is fast, light, and mobile? Bomb techs, however, bigger, heavier. Anywhere from 20 minutes to three hours. Swap maybe overnight, 12 times. If you're in the house, we want to see what happens. Do you have the batteries so you take it to the power supply or how do you do it for long missions like three, four hours? They hope the robot lasts up. Yeah, you just kind of hope the robot lasts. I mean, you, and on the screen, you know, you have an indicator of your battery life. So if it gets, if it looks like it's getting down, that low, then eventually you're going to have to bring it back out and you know and put it in the battery. And, and you, you're always going to have a couple spare batteries there, but you would have to bring it all the way back out. Especially if you thought you know if there's somebody in there with a gun, you wouldn't be able just to walk up there. But you're going to you're going to have to bring it out, and bring it to an area of safety, swap the battery out. But once you get going, you know the battery life is I don't know I was going to say probably a couple of hours. I mean you should have enough battery life on it. If it's fully charged, to go in and search a technical building. So, so the question actually more for better as when you mentioned that some of your rescues are actually in the terrain outdoors. Um, where I guess have, have you been looking at using um, drones with thermal sensors and the line to do your uh, your, your people find you mentioned you use thermal cameras? Do you have, um, do you have any comments on that? Usually, you know. We get lost out of the train. Uh, we usually work with the military, mm -hmm. and they'll use a bird, helicopter, and then they can do some okay. search. Um, it is like, for, as far as we're concerned, we have the equipment and the skill to just uh, do some train <coughs> search by ourselves, but the, prior, the priority would be for use of it. Because the, ther because the thermal imaging will solve a lot of problems, unless the person is dying. <coughs> So, um, so, so no, we're interested. Since the thermal camera is getting much smaller, they could actually go on backpackable drones. Mm -hmm. Sure, throw it up. Well, of course. I mean, I mean, I'm not. I'm not suggesting I'm not against it. It'd be great. But if there were to be a priority, then it would have to be on yeah. side. But I mean, you can go on a terrain with a backpack and throw it at something, and you can just see with that how to call the military helicopter. Great. Yeah, we use thermal imaging every day in our normal in our normal jobs. <coughs> Variety of search and rescue, um, just finding fires hidden in the walls, whatever. So, yeah, we use it. I mean, constantly. And that's a that's a huge asset to us. Because in that sense, like the, like the Prometheus thing I showed, 
if you can throw up something, you can just map an area and you can see it. Um, but that would be a, a great luxury to And they I just comment or ask you guys comment also that uh, rescue robot is more in the rough terrain, very rough terrain. Why uh, bomb tech robot? What what my experience is? It didn't really refine, really like um, manipulation of the robot itself. Like what 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 it needs? Just okay, you can climb up the pavement or stairway or that kind of thing. But same like on the rescue robot mission. Yeah, we have a lot of debris and stuff. Can I conclude like that? Do you understand my question? Can we conclude that bomb tech doesn't need super mobility while rescue robot requires high mobility? I don't know. It's true, yeah, that's very true. Yes. It's, not, it's not true to the limit. I understand. Well, it's possibly well stairs and they need to do it well. Okay. Remember, all right, so you know, we should talk about timing very specifically. Right? The opposite of how long can you last, it's how quick can you get the job done. Mm -hmm. The reason for robotics for these guys is because the robots are going to make them more effective, and more efficient, and safer all along the way. So let's talk about um, let's talk about vehicle born IEDs. Maybe a sort of simplified environment mobility-wise because the vehicle got there, so the robot should be able to drive roughly the same terrain. Mm -hmm. It's up in the next to a building, so it's rather improved, probably. But what we're seeing is, and we're going to try to formalize this, what we're seeing is the reason why they're still putting on those padded suits is because the robot failed. And the robot failed because it was either too hard to get the damn thing downrange because there were some cars in the way or some stuff, or, when they got downrange, they couldn't do anything useful with it anyway, except look in the windows, because they couldn't reach in because they had no dexterity whatsoever. No elegance to them to be able to reach in and dexterity. So, what we've been hearing is, we might be able to actually set some time limits for every phase of a vehicle-borne IED response. Phase one, rapid assessment, get downrange. Maybe the guy's already suiting up. Get down range while he's suiting up, circumnavigate the thing, get the situation where he's break the windows, look inside, try to clear the robot, or try to clear the vehicle. If that doesn't take seven minutes, the robot has failed. I don't know what seven minutes is, but let's just say there's a number that they have in mind. And then they're going to put the bomb suit on and go down and get it done, because they know they can get it done by hand. But we're trying to stop that. So seven minutes might be our limit. So that test method will then have a threshold of performance that you will understand very clearly. If you can't do this task in seven minutes, your robot hardware, your robot interface, isn't sufficient to do the job. But the good news is, it's only about some coordinated control manipulators, some good remote situational awareness using 3D you know, uh, scanners to understand the environment, maybe some good interface. We can do this, is my point. But don't get too hung up on asking them questions like, how do you use robots now? Because the robots aren't answering their needs. So we, we, that's what we're trying to do, is actually improve the robotics that they get exposed to. Then we can ask them how they would use it. Are there any more questions? I'd like to thank our respondent panel for sharing that. And remember, they will be here all week. Please make the most of it. Try and understand their problem. You may be working on technologies that can't be directly applied as you can see, but you, know, you may find still paths where you can still be a, um, a direct benefit or maybe where you can fit into a bigger picture of a, a broader solution. <laughs> and likewise, if you have something cool to show them, or that you know about, please let them know, right? Our, yeah, our, our, our responders here are here to learn about what is coming up. What may, it may not be here in, for another 20 years, but they want to know about it. They want to be able to see what's, um, what's coming up. So, um, I think we'll take a break. <laughs>